This video will show you how to publish papers in QAnon Journal so fast, your colleagues might think you're doing something illegal, allowing you to get tenure faster, become the go-to authority in your field, make a real contribution to science, all while enjoying the process and actually working less. Spoiler alert, this strategy is actually completely ethical and legal, in case you were concerned. But before I can show you how to publish papers in Q1 journals so fast it feels illegal, what we need to do is debunk a big productivity myth that the vast majority of researchers fall victim of. You see, we tend to think of productivity in the following ways. The more hours we put in, the more productive we feel. The more tasks we have on our to-do list, the more productive and the busier we feel. But this leads to a situation where according to research, many researchers actually work 60 or more hours every single week. That's 12 hours, five days a week, or 8.5 hours every single day, including Sundays and all holidays. Well, no surprise then that 47% of researchers feel constant stress and 32% report losing sleep, all just to keep with the demands of publishing. But that's really the opposite of what true productivity is all about. Why? Because productivity equals output divided by input. The output in this case is the papers that you produce and the input is the amount of time and effort exerted to produce those papers. So let's say it takes you six months to produce one paper. Your productivity in this case following our equation would be one sixth. On the other hand, if a researcher does a paper in just four weeks, like one of our clients, Lara, then her productivity is six times higher than your productivity. They just gained five months of extra time, which they can spend producing more research for even better journals, or simply working less and enjoying the time with the families. So the key message here is that you do not become more productive by working longer hours. You become less productive the more hours and the more effort it takes you to complete the same task. Therefore, rather than focus on maximizing our input, i.e. the number of hours, the effort we put in, we need to focus on maximizing the output i.e. the number of papers that you put out. This is what is called leverage. And as Archimedes famously said, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I'll move the world. So what I will show you right now is how you can find your own lever so long you'll be publishing papers in better journals faster while working less, to the point your colleagues might wonder if you're actually doing something unethical or illegal. And spoiler alert, it will be completely legal. And there are three ways which you can use to increase productivity, proficiency, processes, and people. So let's dive in to the first one, proficiency. I hate to break it to you, but one of the fundamental reasons why perhaps you aren't publishing as many papers in as good journals as fast as you would like to is a lack of proficiency. In other words, you just lack the skills to do it because otherwise you would have already done it. To give you an analogy, imagine trying to compete against, say, Carlos Alcaraz with your current tennis skills. You'd get completely destroyed. But that's what most researchers do when writing papers. You hope your skills will just magically improve. If you put in more hours doing the same thing, you'll be just repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And doing the same thing and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Again, to come back to our tennis analogy, you're not going to beat Carlos Alcaraz just by playing longer hours. You need to improve your tennis skills in order to beat Carlos Alcaraz, and you need to improve them fast and by a lot. So the first step to improving your proficiency and thus gaining more leverage so that you can publish more papers in better journals is identifying which specific proficiency areas you're lacking in. This might be reading papers, collecting data, analyzing the data, writing the introduction to the paper. Make a list and then pick one of those skills that will make the biggest difference to your research paper output right now. 
You can pause the video right now and make that list. Once you've picked one skill to focus on, you need to find resources that will help you boost your proficiency in that one specific area. You can take, for example, a free online course on Coursera or in your university. You can maybe read a book, you can watch a YouTube video, or you can join our free published researcher community where we have lots of free resources on how to publish papers. And then what you need to do is commit to deliberate practice of that specific skill. It's not just enough to read or watch a bunch of YouTube videos on the specific area where you're liking. Without committing to deliberately practicing that specific skill, you will quickly slip back to old habits. So the first way to gain leverage and become infinitely more productive so that you can publish more papers than any of your colleagues is to improve your proficiency. The second P of greater productivity is processes or standard operating procedures, if you will. So the big reason why so many researchers work 60 or more hours every single week, struggling to publish papers regularly in the best journals is that they lack proven processes or standard operating procedures. To illustrate this, let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century. The cars were an unaffordable luxury at the time. They were also unreliable and took forever to build. So most people still traveled on horses. But this man, Henry Ford, single-handedly changed everything. How? He created an assembly line with standard operating procedure for each step of the cycle of producing a car. This allowed Henry Ford to predictably produce cars at a much higher speed with a much lower cost than any of his competitors. And in just seven years, one million Model Ts were produced. So you want to think of your research paper pipeline in exactly the same way that Henry Ford thought of cars. You need to standardize the production and create an assembly line with standard operating procedures. However, most researchers lack such an assembly line. They'll write each paper completely from scratch in fits and start at random hours and on random days in random places. All this means then that the result, i.e. the completed paper, is basically random and all left up to chance. On the other hand, if you systematize the whole process of publishing papers from A to Z, from how you conceive of truly novel and groundbreaking ideas, through how you collect and analyze data, to how you write papers and which journals you submit them to, then your result no longer becomes unpredictable and random. And you can be churning out papers one after another. In fact, one of our clients, Helen, did and wrote a whole systematic review from scratch in just 42 days, even though she had zero clue what a systematic literature review even was, all down to the processes and the standard operating procedures that we showed her. And that's in contrast to most researchers who take on average six months to do a systematic literature review. That's a 400% increase in productivity. Or put differently, Helen gained 4.5 months of extra time that did not exist before. That's 180 working hours of extra time. If we put this in monetary terms, even if your hour is only worth 50 US US dollars, that's 9,000 US dollars you just made. All thanks to following a proven standard operating procedure that we laid out for Helen. And that operating procedure should cover everything, like the types of review papers, how to find impactful research topics for those papers, the exact system for uh, conducting the review, step-by-step -step processes for writing each section of the paper, how to find the right journal, how to get the paper ready for submission, how to proofread it, how to respond to reviewers' comments, how to promote your paper afterwards. Every single detail needs to be standardized so that it takes you much less time than it would otherwise, and the quality is much, much higher as well. Imagine how much your productivity would skyrocket if you had similar assembly lines for all papers that you're working on. Now, the third productivity lever that you wanna be pulling is people. And this can be one of the most powerful levers that you can pull if handled properly. And it can be divided into two main categories. Number one, 
mentors who will show you proven shortcuts to drastically increase your productivity and save tons of time. And then number two, people you can train and delegate the work to to increase your output. So let's look at mentors first. After observing the most successful researchers, I can confidently say that I've never ever met a successful researcher who publishes research papers regularly in top journals who would say, look, I'm just going to spend significantly more time trying to figure things out on my own when I know someone who can actually help me achieve that goal in much less time. Because the most successful researchers understand that time is the most precious non-renewable resource that they can have access to. While most researchers and most people, in fact, live their lives as if time was infinite and renewable and they could always get more of it, the most successful researchers invest their resources, i.e. money, to buy back more time. And mentors can be incredibly powerful. For example, thanks to my own PhD mentor, I did my PhD in just three years with three published papers. Quite possibly, his mentorship saved me a year of additional PhD studies because most of my colleagues took four years or even longer to finish their PhDs. That's a year extra time or 12 months or 4,800 working hours. In monetary terms, that's huge as well. That's at the very least 36,000 US dollars. So even if three years of PhD investing in that mentor because I was a self-funded student cost me around 16,000 US dollars at the time, that's still a 2x return on my investment. Not to mention that you get to start working full-time much faster and you can gain a higher salary much faster. That's what you should think about if and ever you hesitate about investing in a mentor. So what I'd urge you to do right now is to find that right mentor. When looking for them, think about two really important things. Number one, that person needs to have achieved what you are trying to achieve. But that's obviously not enough. The second, even more important ingredient is that that mentor has a proven track record of helping other people like yourself solve the exact same problems and achieve the exact same goals. Now, the second category of the people pillar of productivity is people that you can hire, train, and delegate your work to. For example, if you're a professor, you'll have students under you. If they are trained properly, they can take your productivity to the next level, allowing you to publish so many papers you didn't even think was possible. But the reality is that most PhD supervisors don't train the PhD students properly. They expect their PhD students to be independent and produce papers offering little to no guidance. Sorry to break it to you, but meeting your PhD students once every four to six weeks just isn't gonna cut it. Same goes for not giving feedback for weeks or months or until a paper is finished, or not giving standard operating procedures for each single part of the PhD process. You're basically shooting yourself in the foot if you're doing that, because every PhD student can produce so much more if you give that guidance to them. Imagine just for a second that each PhD student received clear standard processes for how to find high impact research topics, do literature review faster, write papers, collect and analyze data. How much more productive would each of them be? How many more papers would each of them produce with how much less effort and much less time on your side? You'd essentially end up with a paper assembly line totally legally, each of your students producing maybe two papers every single year with, at some point, almost minimal effort on your side. So if you have 10 students, that's potentially 20 papers every single year that you can add your name to. So if you're a professor, commit time in your calendar to developing those proven processes and procedures for your PhD students so they can start producing much higher quality work with much less effort on your side. So if you want to be more productive and publish more papers, you need to maximize your output per unit of time or effort that you put in through the three P's, proficiency, processes, and people. If you apply this, you will be publishing papers so fast it will feel 
illegal. That said, you might be wondering what does it actually take to write three papers every single year for Q1 Scopus Index Journal. This next video reveals exactly that.